May this message lead you to a deep reflection on the processes and tools of self-transformation provided by the renowned Yogi Sadhguru. If you want to start your yoga journey with Sadhguru, click on the link in the description of this video and learn more. It is just the memory that you carry. Here there is a memory which transforms everything the way it is. So, this dimension of intelligence which is called as chitta, which is untouched by any kind of memory, just pure intelligence, is of significance because it's beyond. It is beyond your species, it is beyond your form, it's beyond your gender, it's beyond your culture, it's beyond every kind of influence which is essentially memory within you. Maybe unconscious, but it is memory playing out in so many ways. As long as memory is playing out, what it means is you're… in India we say you're in a state of samsara. Samsara means lot of people today understand as family. <laughs> samsara doesn't mean family, samsara means a cyclical life. You're in cycles of life. If you're in cycles or if you're going in circles, what does it mean? That means you're not getting anywhere, that's what it means. A cycle is nice, it gives you good exercise. This is like running on a treadmill. If you're seeking exercise, it's good. But if you want to go somewhere, it's no good. If you put your treadmill out here and keep running on it, morning becomes evening, fall becomes winter, winter becomes summer, everything will happen. Seasons will change, scenery will change, everything will happen. Only thing is you don't go anywhere. This is what samsara means. As long as you're functioning within the first three dimensions of intelligence, you are in a cyclical mode. It is all right to exercise yourself, but it's not good to go somewhere. So if you want to transcend the samsara, nature of who you are or the cyclical nature of your existence, then you touch the dimension of intelligence which is referred to as chitta. Why the so-called Eastern wisdom is of great significance, why the dharma of the East is so significant and important is because this comes from chitta. This does not come from buddhi, this does not come from manas, this does not come from ahankara, this comes from chitta. And only that which does not come from your individual identity or individual memory, that can be truly universal. So for this we said, this is Sanatan Dharma. This does not mean Hindu religion, this is a very wrong conception. Sanatan Dharma means the ultimate law of nature. When we say nature, there is physical nature and there is an inner nature. There are two dimensions for this. Accordingly, we made two dimensions of loss. Physical nature is a changing thing. It's always in a process of change and a flux. But the inner nature is a constant process. So we made two dimensions of expression for this dharma called shrutis and smritis. One is always to be updated for every generation. Otherwise, two generations will keep on bickering and clashing. You have to update it. Another is eternal, it's always there. It's nobody's business to change it because it cannot be changed because the fundamentals of life has not changed. Based on this, an entire wisdom arose as to how to exist within you and how to operate around you. This happened in 1924. There was a bishop in the orthodox Greek uh, religion, where, you know, there's orthodox Greek segment of uh, Christians. They have a pope of their own in Istanbul. They believe they are the only true Christians. Others are all riffraff, according to them. So, he served this particular segment, which is very orthodox and rigid. Being in Istanbul, being on the Silk Route, all kinds of stories of Indian mysticism kept wafting across the Bosphorus. So he has a longing to go to India 
and see a real yogi or a mystic. But being a man of cloth, he could not choose where to go and where not to go. After he passed sixty years of age, when he semi-retired, he got an opportunity and went to India and came to southern India. So his desire is to meet a real yogi, not a book yogi, not a studio yogi, but a real one. So somebody directed him and said, go up this hill, there in this kind of place there will be one yogi. So he went up. Well, he's not made for the mountains, he went huffing and puffing up and then he found in front of a small cave, a yogi was sitting, eyes closed, totally blissed out. He went there and uh, he has been told that if you see a yo Indian yogi, you must prostrate. Well, he was not made for that <laughs> but he somehow managed, huffed and puffed and sat down. Hearing this com commotion, the yogi opened his eyes and smiled. Immediately the bishop looked at him and said, Can I ask you a question? The yogi said, By all means. The bishop asked, What is life? This is after sixty. You should have asked this question when you were eight, <laughs> at least when you're sixteen, <laughs> sixty. But what to do, better late than never, <laughs> he asked. Then yogi <coughs> laughed and went into raptures. Oh, life… life is like the fragrance of jasmine upon gentle spring breeze. The bishop looked at him and said, what? <laughs> Life is like fragrance of jasmine upon gentle spring breeze. Our teacher told us, life is like a thorn. <laughs> Once it gets into you, if, it, if you sit it hurts, if you stand it hurts, if you lie down it hurts. <laughs> what is this fragrance of jasmine upon gentle spring breeze? Spring breeze? So the yogi smiled and said, well, that's his life <laughs> So this comes from the fundamental that when a human being clearly, experientially understands that entire experience of human life is created from within, never from outside. Right now as you sit here, do you at least see me? Even if you're not listening to me, I'm saying. <laughs> Can you use your hand and show where I am? Ah, no, no, you're getting it all wrong. You know, I'm a mystic from South India <laughs> Now this light is falling upon me, reflecting, going through your lenses, inverted image in the retina, you know the whole story. Where do you see me right now? Within yourself. Where do you hear me right now? Within yourself, where have you seen the entire world? Within yourself, have you ever experienced anything outside of yourself? Right now, someone next to you, if they touch you, you think you're experiencing their hand. No, you're only experiencing the sensations in your hand. In the very nature of things, you cannot experience anything outside of yourself. When everything, when the entire experience of life is caused from within you, at least it must happen the way you want it, isn't it? Hmm? The world will not happen the way you want it. At least <laughs> the experience of living here within you must happen the way you want it. If… if… if your experience of life happened just the way you want it, how would you keep yourself, blissful or miserable? Please, you must tell me I'm going to bless you <laughs> Blissful or miserable? Blissful. For yourself, definitely highest level of pleasantness for yourself. What you want for your neighbor may be debatable, <laughs> but you know what you want for yourself, isn't it? Now, blissfulness or pleasantness of life is not a goal by itself. 
it is only when you're blissful by your own nature. That means you determine the nature of your experience. No matter what is the situation, you determine the nature of your experience. Or in other words, you have no fear of suffering. Only and only when there is no fear of suffering, will you walk full stride in this life. Otherwise, it's always about what will happen to me, what will happen to me. Every step is a half a step. Now, this so-called spirit of Eastern wisdom comes from those beings who walked full stride, who determined the nature of their experience. The outside never decided who they are. So, they could walk full stride and explore the depths and dimensions of life that others never dare to touch because most of the humanity is only concerned about what will happen to me. What will happen to me means what? Will I suffer? That's a question. The first and foremost thing, if you truly want to explore dimensions which we are referring to as another dimension of wisdom or knowing is that first you must determine the nature of your experience. You have no fear of suffering. Only then, truly exploring human consciousness becomes a reality. Touching dimensions of intelligence which gives access to the entire universe becomes a possibility. I'm supposed to open up for questions. <laughs> it's time you ask your questions, please. The population I work with that are in the verge of homelessness or they're addicts, if I tell them that it is your intellect and it's your perception and this doesn't exist, they will laugh at me because it definitely they exists. Must, because yeah. it's the dumbest thing to say. Right. So, I wanted to know the spirituality that you teach, the spirituality that many gurus teach, how is it usable for someone that doesn't have food to eat and it's going to become homeless and there's so many problems, especially in America. I mean, how do... Of course, I teach them resiliency. It's a different fact. But to, every time I want to open my mouth and use some of your teachings, I have to set back. Now, the first uh, problem is uh, that you believe in the teachings because this is the problem with the entire world. They've been cultured in some belief or the other. This is what is significant about what is referred to as Sanatana Dharma or what is referred to as the Indian way of looking at things is, this is not a land of belief systems, this is a land of seekers. Never ever were anybody encouraged to believe anything. If you see anything that comes from that land, you will see it is all about questions, <laughs> never about a belief system. If you enter an Indian home, in the same house, Five different people are worshipping twenty-five different gods and goddesses. <laughs> they still not made up their minds, which is… I think a sabbatical <laughs> is good <laughs> He may come up with something that you've not thought possible. <laughs> I will… I will convey your message, Jai Sadhguru. <laughs> I'm sure he's watching this program <laughs> <laughs> Sadhguru, I believe that talent is something which is grossly exaggerated in success. It's… when I was in medical school, I used to teach martial art. Uh, that was my passion <laughs> and uh, every time a Bruce Lee's movie was released, all these school kids would come and join in hordes to martial arts schools. We used to call it Bruce Lee They're gone after two weeks. <laughs> yes. And I used to see some kids whose physique is meant for martial art, who have the natural flair and I used to think, oh, this kid is going to get a black belt. And interestingly, Swamiji, mm -hmm. after six months, they're never there. The guys who go up to the black belt and, you know, do something very good in martial art are the ones 
who joined the school without any skills, without any talent, who worked very, very hard for everything they had to sweat it out. But in the end, they are the ones who succeed. How do you explain this phenomenon? <clears throat> See, uh, for a variety of reasons, let me not go beyond this. For a variety of reasons, a certain individual could be born with a certain flair, physical flair, mental flair, emotional flair, style. You know, five-year-old child, one has style, other is clumsy, okay? <laughs> so the one with the style is not going to become necessarily a fashion thing. Somebody else who seems to be clumsy may grow into something else. Like, uh, you don't know when a woman is pregnant, the child within that womb, whether it's a sage or a sorcerer, not the woman know. No, the mother does not know whether she is producing a sage or a sorcerer or what. This is because, I use the word coherence because of modern science is using that word. Who you are here right now, as you sit here, this is physics. Every subatomic particle is in constant contact with everything. What you call as cosmos is living life and it's a live mind. You have captured only one small part of it. If you work with only that one smart, small part of what you have captured, both as life and as intelligence, you will function at a certain level. If you apply yourself to break the barriers of your limitations that you've set for yourself, then there is an intelligence beyond anybody's understanding beyond anybody's estimate which is available to you. Once this is available to you, people think you are superhuman. No, this is not about being superhuman. This is about realizing that being human is super. The immensity of being human has not been realized. So we are always making a, a kind of a mathematical calculation Okay, if this person has this much IQ, maybe this is what he will become. This is what Newton's law, that everything that moves on this planet works to a mathematical precision or a geometric precision. That is, if you take a pendulum, the length of the pendulum will decide how it will swing. If you take a projectile, depending upon its mass, velocity and uh, the, pr the trajectory, it will go to a certain place. That is not how the cosmos is working because what you think is physical and not physical is all mixed up within this, within this human being. The physical self, the psychological self, the emotional self and who you call as myself, the life within you, the fundamental life process, these are all different dimensions and the innermost core of who you are which, because all the other words are corrupted, I'll use the word life or just you, what you call as me. This if you allow it, if you do not identify it with any form, with your physical form or with other different identities that you take on, it has a, a way of being cohesive or collaborative with everything around. When we say somebody worked hard, all he is trying to do is stretch his boundary of identity, isn't it? He's trying to stretch his boundary. If he succeeds to set, stretch his boundary, something that was… he never thought possible or imagined that is within his competence or capability becomes his. Miraculously, I can show you hundreds of people who come to me, we prepare them for a certain period and then we initiate them. In twenty-four hours, you will see the shape of their face will change. Genetics are altered in twenty-four hours' time. You can see the photographic images, they have actually changed dramatically overnight simply because of a certain extension of their identity. So, in the Indian spiritual milieu, see when you say spiritual, we must understand this. This is not about looking up or looking down. When we say spiritual, we are talking about transcending the limitations of physical. So right now, the physical is here as if it's a solid entity in people's experience. But modern physics is telling you and medical science is beginning to telling, tell you, or if people don't understand, if they just hold their nose for two minutes, they understand that they are not an independent existence. It is in transaction, not just in terms of breath, 
Even on the level of subatomic particles, it's in constant transaction. If this transaction becomes even minutely conscious, suddenly you have immense capabilities that you never thought were possible. Biological identity is the most limiting identity that you have because it limits to the area of your body. Now when you strive, you break this. It doesn't matter in what way you strive. Most people strive in unconscious, unscientific, simply out of striving, they do things. But there are ways to strive scientifically in a proper way. There are tools to strive with specific direction to break the limitations of who we are. If you break this boundary, the subatomic particles are transacting, the intelligence is transacting, only you're missing the whole game. If you don't miss the game, if you are in the game of life, not in the game of thoughts and emotions, you are in the game of life, suddenly just about anything you want you can do, not this or that. I'm saying anything can a human being can do, simply if he breaks his barriers. And these barriers are many levels, but the most fundamental thing is the identity. And it has tremendous memory. If I open this water or even without opening, if I say something to this water, it remembers. There has been lot of experiments in this direction. So, uh, if you take this water from wherever the waterworks is and pump it to your house, let's say it went through fifty bends, forced, pumped forcefully with a certain force, which naturally is done, and you are living on twelfth floor of the apartment, so further forced up. Now they are saying, if it goes through fifty bends, about sixty percent of the water has turned poisonous. Immediately when it comes in the tap, if you take it and immediately drink it, it will work as poison in your system. If you take it and hold it for some time, it will undo itself again. Because the poisoning is not chemical, it is molecular. Molecular changes are happening, no chemical change is happening. This is why traditionally your grandmother always told you, always you must gather the water, keep it overnight in your house, in a properly cleaned vessel with vibhuti and kunkum on it and one flower on it. Yes or no? In traditional homes, only tomorrow morning you drink it. Not as soon as it comes inside your house, you don't drink it because it carries all kinds of memories. In very traditional homes, people every day do puja to the water pot. Yes? And you never drink the water as soon as it comes, you keep it, give it enough time to undo itself from whatever nonsense it has gathered so that it is suitable for you when you drink it. Water you must take care because it's seventy-two percent. It's more, it's first class, you know, more than passing mark. Next thing is food because that's the earth, twelve percent. One more thing if you want to do, you just light an organic oil lamp, a cotton wick, some oil, anything. What do you use here? Normal cooking oil, linseed oil, rice bran oil, or sesame oil, what do you have? Olive oil. Olive oil, fine. Any organic oil with a cotton wick, just burn one little lamp somewhere in the room where you sleep. You will see these things will completely disappear. If you can bring in a chant or there are nightly practices, yogic practices, before you go to bed, sit on your bed and do this practice. Do you know, in about… if you live for about sixty years, you're… on an average most human beings are eating anywhere between eleven hundred to fourteen hundred tons of food. So that means even what you think is my body is not this, it's changing every day. New input is happening and old things are going away. So fourteen hundred tons, you don't have to carry that much of weight right now. So obviously what you have as a body right now is just a transient amount of food and soil, isn't it? Hello? So what you think is mine also is not it, it is just all the time changing. Tonight before you go to bed, spend at least twelve, fifteen minutes reminding yourself, you're neither this body nor this mind. Just lie down, 
and just remind yourself, this body is not really you. It is mine right now for use, but it's not really me. Just… if you're not able to do it, just link it to your breath. Inhalation, I am not the body. Exhalation, I am not even the mind. Just lie down for twelve minutes and do it. Till the last moment, till you fall asleep. This is something you must notice. Yes or no? There are joyful people and miserable people, but there are no good people and bad people. The… the moment we think we are good, we are entitled to destroy the bad, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, we've been destroying a lot of people for a long time. Time to stop that <laughs> because human beings are in different levels of experience and understanding, variety of people. Anybody who is not like you is obviously bad, isn't it? <laughs> Isn't it so? Those who are not like me must be bad people. Because the basis of goodness and what you think is goodness is decided by you. No, you have no business to do that. Willing means this, I'm just willing. I'm a hundred percent yes to life. I am not yes to this one, no to this one, no. I am just yes and yes to life. If you are a hundred percent yes to life, you are a volunteer. Oh, that's you have become a willing life. You have become so willing that you have no will of your own. People ask me, Sadhguru, how do you operate with all these people? All kinds of horrible questions they're asking, they're doing this, they're doing that. I said, my life is not about them, it's about me. Mm. It's about how I am. It's about me. It doesn't matter how they are, that's their choice. But how I am is my choice, this is my way. No matter what they do, I am like this. Because I have not given that freedom to anybody, that somebody can freak me, somebody can make me angry, somebody can make me happy, somebody can make me unhappy, these privileges I kept to myself. It's time you do that too, because if somebody else can decide, what can happen within you right now? Isn't this the ultimate slavery? Huh? Isn't this? Someone else can decide what should happen within you. What happens around you, of course, sim so many people decide. Hmm? What happens around us is not hundred percent ours. But what happens within me must be my making, isn't it? Right now, just about anybody can freak anybody because they're not volunteers. They're unwilling. Volunteering means you have no will of your own. You can do whatever is needed. You know, we are a volunteer organization. This means uh, all kinds of people. <laughs> Most of them are not qualified for the jobs that they're doing. <laughs> and I cannot fire them because they're volunteers <laughs> So people keep coming up to me on a daily basis and say, Sadhguru, I can't work with this person, she is so horrible, I can't do it. I tell them, see, in this world, this is the sort of people who exist, like this, like this, like this, like this, this is the kind of people there are. But if you want to work with ideal people, you must go to heaven <laughs> and today, Today. But if you think what you're doing is very significant, you must learn to work with all these horrible people. Many problems that human beings are suffering is simply because we have lost that awareness as to how to be in sync with the many forces. If you become in rhythm with life, you will also wake up somewhere after 3 a.m. At that time, if you sit up and do Whatever process you have been initiated for, it will bear maximum fruit. In the way the planet is spinning and what is happening, something very fundamental changes, 
somewhere between 320 to 340. This is called Brahma Mahurtam. This is relevant only up to 33 degrees latitude. Your system, human system, functions in a certain way. It is a possibility. So, uh, there has been an awareness about making use of this possibility. Your life is a product of many things that we call as the universe, many things that we call as existence. So, we are a consequence of a certain phenomenal happening that we call as cosmos. We are not an individual existence. So, when you get in sync, certain things will happen. You know, there's a <coughs> cicadius in uh, where we are in Tennessee, the U.S. ashram, they wake up once in seventeen years. Can you beat it? They know it is seventeen years and they come awake and they breathe and they go back to sleep. They're keeping time once in seventeen years, no alarm bell anywhere. Well, how is this? I'm saying they are in sync with nature. We have lost sync within nature and we think that is our nature. No. All the many ailments, many problems that human beings are suffering is simply because we have lost that awareness as to how to be in sync with the many forces which are making us who we are. So yoga is to bring that sync so that you are in rhythm with life. If you become in rhythm with life, you will also wake up somewhere just after three a.m. If you're conscious, suddenly a certain spark of aliveness will happen within you. Even if you're in deep sleep, you will come awake. This must happen to you. This means you're falling in sync with it. You're falling in sync with life. So what should I do? Should I meditate? Should I do a Kriya? Doesn't matter what, you must do a process for which you have been initiated for. Because initiation means you were not just taught a practice, it was introduced into your system, it was implanted in your system. So whatever, if there is a life seed within you, if you are awake at Brahma Mahartam and sit for whatever that practice is, it bears maximum fruit because of the way the planet is behaving in relation to your system. If you become aware in a certain way, a certain level of awareness is achieved within you, you will see, you will simply know when that time is. If you go to bed at the right time, you don't have to look at your watch. You will always know when it is 3.40, because the body will behave in a different way. At that time, if you sit up and do whatever process you have been initiated for, not what you picked up from a book, it will bear maximum fruit. The seed will get the necessary support at that time for it to sprout or spurt up more rapidly than, you, uh, than at other times. This is only for the initiated. If you are not initiated, you are a book yogi, then 3.40, 6.40, 7.40, not so much of a difference. Sandhya colors are more important for such people. Sandhya means twenty minutes before sunrise, twenty minutes after sunrise, or twenty minutes before sunset and twenty minutes after sunset. The same goes for noon and midnight, but they are of a different nature. So these two twilights, are better for the uninitiated. 
340 is good for those who've been powerfully initiated. You can incubate a lot of either negative things or positive things in sleep. This is getting too easy, just sleeping sadhana. So coming awake to an alarm bell with a sudden start is not the best way to do your life. How many of you find uh, that one day morning when you get up without any reason, you're just feeling ugly for no reason? If it is happening even at least two, three times a year, if it is, then you must do certain things before you go to bed. It's very, very important because unconsciously, you need to understand this, you can incubate a lot of either negative things or positive things in sleep. Either pleasantness or unpleasantness, you can incubate very effectively uninterrupted in sleep. You can also incubate it in the day, but there are so many interruptions, it doesn't happen very efficiently. But if you have a tendency to go to bed in a certain way and you wake up in the morning really nasty for simply no reason, that means you are incubating things in the night very efficiently. Bad eggs. This is not just about psychological disturbances, it can cause major physiological problems over a period of time. It's, it's important that you eliminate these things from your life. So, before you go to bed in the night, there are certain things that you need to take care of. It's best if you're eating meat and other kinds of meals, you eat at least three to four hours before you go to bed. The digestion is over. Before going to bed, drink a certain amount of water and go to bed. You will see it gets taken care of just like this. One simple thing can be just a shower, always to shower before you go to bed, it'll make a lot of difference. In this weather, maybe cold showers are difficult, so you go for lukewarm showers, don't go for hot showers in the night, go for lukewarm showers, it makes you alert. So you will think, oh, I cannot sleep. It doesn't matter, you will sleep fifteen, twenty minutes or half an hour later, but you will sleep better because it will take away certain things. When you shower, it is not just the dirt on the skin that you're taking away. Have you noticed if you're very tense and anxious, whatever, just a shower, you came out and feels like almost the burden has been taken away from you? Have you not noticed this? So it's not just about washing the skin, a whole lot of things happen when water flows over your body. This shower is a very rudimentary bhuti shuddhi because over seventy percent of your body is actually water. If you run water over it, a certain purification happens which is beyond cleaning the skin. Keep this in your mind that you are truly a mortal, okay? Not in words, really, you could fall dead right now. Uh, you may be young, you may be old, it doesn't matter, you can fall dead right now, yes or no? Before you go to bed, sit on your bed and think this is your deathbed. You have just one more minute to live. Just look back and see, what you have done today, is it worthwhile? Just do this one simple exercise and you don't know when it really happens, whether you'll be sitting on your deathbed or lying in a hospital, all kinds of things sticking into you, who knows how it'll happen. But Enjoy this every day that you will sit on your deathbed, look back and see today, the way I have handled these twenty-four hours, is it worthwhile? Because now I am dying. If you do this, you will live a worthwhile life, believe me. So every day in the night, all of you should do this before you go to bed. Last three minutes, everything that you have gathered, the body, the content of the mind, things. Don't ignore small things, the small things are big things. I've seen how people are carrying their… their own private pillow, you know? 
because it's very important. <laughs> so, your pillow, your footwear, if you have relationships, everything that you have gathered, keep it aside, sleep. If you sleep in that condition, you will wake up with much more light, with much more energy, with much more possibilities than you have imagined possible. Just sleep as life, not as a man, not as a woman, not as this and that. Keep everything down, simply. See, I'm, this is getting too easy. Just sleeping sadhana, hmm? At least this you must do. Visionary Women is a volunteer-run uh, organization and I know that every single person who is here is giving their time to one organization or another. And the fact that you have nine million volunteers and you were talking about the relationship between volunteerism and willingness and that it's through willingness that you uplift your consciousness, if I'm quoting you correctly or I'm understanding it. In some ways, talking about how it could be a doorway to becoming a bigger person than mm -hmm. who you are. See, uh, before we come to women, first thing is visionary. What a vision, a vision means is, see everybody has desires. Desire is an incre incremental way of enhancing our life. Today you desire, I must have a home, tomorrow you desire, I must have this money, tomorrow you desire something else. These are incremental ways of arranging and rearranging our lives, mm -hmm. which are needed to do a few things. When you say, I'm a visionary, what you are saying is, I have a larger desire, which is not about just incremental improvement of my life. Desire is about me always. Vision is an all-inclusive all process. So, this itself is a phenomenal thing. If people, instead of having desires, if they have a vision, mm -hmm. vision is always all-inclusive. Desire is personal. Desire leads to incremental changes and improvements. Vision can transform the whole situation. I like music <laughs> So, uh, about willingness, because you said you're a volunteer organist, to be a volunteer, a volunteer means somebody who is doing something willingly, right? There's no other compulsion. There are no financial compulsions, there are no social compulsions, there is no something else. You want to do something willingly. So when you're a willing participant right now, you're a volunteer. I'm asking all of you, right now, are you compelled to be here or are you here voluntarily? Oh, thank you <laughs> Because I've sp spoken to conscripted people also. What means focus to you and which way can we apply focus in our daily life? So what's your definition of focus? Okay. Uh, there are many ways to describe this word. Instead of saying focus, if you use the word attention, would you agree that attention and focus are about the same thing? There is a little difference, there is… there are nuances to it. But when you say focus, it's just like focusing a light on something means only a focus is always a spot. Attention can be much more widespread. See, right now, if you have clear vision, I am having problems seeing the young man because you kept him in darkness there in the hall <laughs> But if the hall was well lit, I don't have to focus myself to see the people who are sitting here. I just need attention. If I am attentive, I will see all the people here the way they are. But now I get interested in this one young man, then I need focus. 
If I had only focus without the general attention about everything around me, indiscriminate attention I'm talking about, attention not even about something, just being attentive because only because there is a certain level of attention and awareness within you, you even know that you exist. Otherwise, let's say in sleep, in your experience, neither the world exists nor you exist, all that's happened is there is no attention, because there is no attention, there is no perception of any kind. He knows his strength is gone on the football field, because there are younger boys who are running. So you've not seen Messi or Ronaldo in all the games. It is just that, who is able to extract the best out of the given situation? Namaskaram Sadhguru, you are a football fan. In your view, who is better between Messi and Ronaldo? See, this is the whole thing. On a given day, maybe I can play better than Messi. But that doesn't make me better than him because he's got... He's climbed through the steps, all right? One ball, if he kicks into the goal, it may go above the goal. If I kick, it may go in. So I'll say, I'm better than Messi. It doesn't work like that. So it's not who is better than whom, it is just that who is able to extract the best out of the given situation. Well, because you're talking about an international game, Messi has had the fortune, I would say, to win that game. Because as everybody could see, he's lost his pace, still got fantastic skills, but he doesn't have speed, he's not able to run with the young boys, he's not able to retain the ball but he's very good, so he realizes that. He's not a fool to try to outrun those young boys and kill himself. He's just giving the necessary passes and making the difference. That's a smart man, isn't it? Very smart man. He's not thinking I should score. He's just making sure the ball is in the right place so that somebody scores. So he's using his skills. He knows his strength is gone on the football field because there are younger boys who are running, you know, always two, three steps ahead of him. So, this whole thing about... Now what you're asking is, is a jasmine flower b better or a rose flower better? So you've not seen Messi or Ronaldo in all the games. If you see both of them in variety of club games that they've played, which is where their skills were largely exhibited, in international games they're little out of place because it's not their regular teammates, and uh, international games are a little rougher, not by the rule, because national emotions are there. These fine players cannot play very well there. Ruffians play better <laughs> Very fine players cannot play very well in international games. In the club games, everybody is a professional. They play a certain level of game, there they will excel. So both of them have excelled beautifully in their clubs. Well, sometimes when you made a wrong choice of entering a wrong club and stuff, even if you're a great player, say Ronaldo sits on the bench in Manchester, Manchester United, because issues, other issues other than football will come up. Ronaldo did his best, but towards the end, he I could not do his best because he couldn't handle the situations and the realities of life at the age of thirty-seven, what he should be. I think Messi handled that situation of his age gracefully and I think it paid off for him. And it's not all in his hands, the team and the situations, the opposition teams, many, many things are there. So if you want to see in the finals, is Bappe better or Messi better? Bappe is way better. He's playing like Pelé, all right? But things didn't work. Things didn't work, he's only twenty-three. He's moving faster than almost anybody in the entire tournament, but couldn't win. In the end, that's all that matters. This is what you need to understand. What we are doing in our lives is not all ours. Many things are there. It's happened to you many times, you hit the tree but it went on the green. Oh, that's how you win <laughs> It happens. You hit, you think you hit a great shot but it bounced somewhere else. You hit a bad shot, but it came back where it should be. Well, all these factors are there. So don't go looking for luck hitting the trees. No, you do your best. What happens is not all yours.
that goes for even the best champions of champions, all right? No question. So it's not right at any time that you don't pose this question even to yourself. Am I better than the guy who's sitting next to you? Don't do this. What is the best I can do? That's all. 